becomes of it. You actually still have it in your pocket. If we take the egg with us to Sands' grocery store and interact with the basket of eggs, it's a pile of eggs. You put the egg into the egg pile. Did you just, uh, reverse steal that egg? Seems like there's more eggs here than usual. Yeah, obviously, we just put one there. At the end part of the game, if we go back to the classroom, Tem will be here. Tem still study. Study hard. Tem get a smart. Go to college. Achieve dream. Then Tem become... Tem become... <laughs> as if you could even envision it. If we still have the egg with us when we interact with Tem. They put an egg out on their desk. The eggs you have collected so far. There's two. This is on a save file where I've collected both of those secret eggs. If in your chapter one save file, after ringing this bell, dodging around the Starwalker bird, if you backtrack to the original Starwalker, say hello to them, they're pissed off, same as usual. But it sets things up for chapter two. In the sequence where Lancer and Rules Cart add themselves to your pocket as you're leaving the Dark World, this will also make Starwalker show up. I will also join. And we finally get to see this. When you grab the disposable ball aluminum cup, you experience a premium cup. You'll feel the cool, wagger filled walk of the original Starwalker. When you check your key items, the Starwalker is always in the top left now, no matter where you go in the menu. I guess they're hanging out in the menu the same way Lancer and Rules Card are. The original Starwalker. Same as Rules Card, it cannot be interacted with at this time. Now in the overworld, we have our same ball of junk, but also have cards. The Jack of Spades and the Rules Card. Confirming a small little theory I had seen online and included in my Sans is a Dark Nair theory video. Maybe it was obvious, but I was excited to see that confirmed. The Starwalker does not appear in our menu. Outside of this little boardwalk carnival game area, as the team is reassembling, we do get a quick cameo. I will also join. It's one of the few times Starwalker actually steps out of the key item's pocket. Birdly and Starwalker only pile on for that one screen. They're now both immediately gone. And he has one final cameo when we're assembling our friends for the big jumbo robot battle at the end. He joins simply announcing himself Starwalker. A great callback, a bit of an internal reference. Back when Lancer tries to help Susan grab the dark candy off the tree, I have a special transformation for times like this. Watch and learn, team. With a big flash and an explosion, look, stool form. All you did was put your hands on the ground. You may criticize it, Ralph say, but you obviously paid attention and learned just as Lancer asked. They've been practicing, even. Magical stool form are for Ralsei, I presume. Although I would say Ralsei seemingly doesn't have the same core strength. Maybe it has to do with a different uh, center of gravity for our more rotund friend. When Lancer travels into your pocket, he uses friendship form. Somewhat referencing back to his ability to turn into a stool form. Apparently he has a multitude of forms. When you're first locked up in the card castle and interact with the moss in the corner. I've covered this before. Here you can choose to eat the moss. It tastes mossy. Your HP was mossed out. The moss has been eaten. The cycle continues. And of course, if you backtrack with Susie, she is jealous that our cell had moss, and that we didn't even save any for her. Again, in the castle, in your own room made by Ralsei, in the bottom right hand corner, it's some decorative moss. Looks delicious. Why the hell does your room get moss? In the corner of the area with the secret dumpster, you found the moss, written in green this time. Your title was upgraded to Moss Finder. Why do they look so pleased? Inspecting our status? Moss Finder. 
basic moss finding abilities. After witnessing us gobbling up our moss, we can inspect Noelle's status as well. She is now listed as moss neutral, neither chaotic nor lawful to moss, a play on the alignments seen in Dungeons and Dragons. Back in chapter one, if you inspect every one of the Hathi's beds, you thoroughly investigated all the beds. Your rank was upgraded to bed inspector. Seen here in Chris's status, inspects all beds inexplicably. When Ralstay makes you your individual rooms, if you had that bed inspector rank, it's a bed that's been carefully crafted. It's suitable for a bed inspector. In the bottom right corner of town, seems Hathi likes this place. She hopes you'll find enough beds to inspect. You'll lose your bed inspector title if you don't inspect enough beds. Lancer's room has been lifted from the card castle pretty well identically. While he's not in the room, a bicycle is lovingly tucked into bed. Here we have a near exact replication of Lancer's room. Now listed as being cool, I, I don't know if I would classify it as such. Now if you interact with the bed, Wow, it's better than I remember. I even have my own bed now. Now I don't have to sleep in a hole anymore. I thought you already had a bed. Nope, that was for the bike. We have the glorious return of this mystery fiend. Not really sure who he is. We're never given a name. Completely unidentifiable. Well, the vessel from that opening sequence is discarded, seemingly along with everything else. There's one detail that does carry over. When we talk to this rooted, welcome to Butt Town, which I named it Butt. This is being pulled specifically from your creator name, that one tied to your save file. So at least one thing carries over and was saved and is acknowledged again by this game. When Susie asks about jumping down into this new dark world, let's go, let's go. Yeah, let's just drop the act. Our last adventure was great, right? I couldn't stop thinking about having another. I don't know what's in there, but we can't live if we don't find out, right? Come on, Chris. And if you had instead chosen, we can use the computer at my house. Chris, you're right. Like you said, a uh, correct fact. But you made a mistake. The mistake of knowing me. When I see a big pit, all I want to do is jump in. And as long as you're with me, I'm dragging you in too. Come on, Chris. As a mini callback to Chapter 1, when you have an assortment of three unique enemies, it gets referred to as a smorgasbord. So here in Chapter 2, we see that again. We have the sequel, Smorgasbord to Electric Bordaloo. This is around the point in the video where I was going to start layering in things that have to do with Spamton and Spamton Neo and the secret boss fight, and all those extra details. And it so quickly was getting out of hand and was so much more complex than I was anticipating, even though I knew there was so much to it, that I basically have to make the executive decision here that Spamton is going to get like a dedicated video. Rather than having this, I don't know, 30 minute video where 20 minutes of it is talking about Spamton, I gotta pick and choose here. I'm gonna take my time on that video, make sure I do it right. No promises when that's coming. But there you go, something to look forward to other than these more broad look at the Gaster eggs. One last time before rounding the video up, go and wishlist Dead Estate. It genuinely helps so much. It has already begun to help so much. We can't wait to see where that goes. Believe me, what I'm sharing here now in this video is not even remotely close to all the secrets. In the process of putting this video together, I probably found an entire video's worth extra. I say found, I found some of them myself. A lot of them have been shared through other YouTubes and our Discord and various comments through every possible means you can imagine. 
I'm working on compiling those now. I botched some of the footage, so I have to repair it. I'll probably do what I did with Delta Room Chapter 1 Gaster Eggs and kind of just assemble them willy nilly. I know with my Undertale installments, I'm doing them by area, and that works really well because everything in that game has been so well documented over the last six years. We're kind of doing this one live, figuring it out together, so it's kind of getting thrown in all mishmashed out of order, but hopefully by the end of this series of videos, however long that series needs to be, we'll have as much covered as possible. Thank you to patrons of the channel whose names are scrolling off to the right. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon. And yeah, welcome to the light bulb. Real quick, I've got to thank a friend of the channel, Shannon, for crocheting me this tiny replica of my favorite rainbow sweater. Thank you, Shannon. It's so cute. Tokyo was such a fun project for me, I knew I wouldn't be able to resist making more rainbow high schoolers. I got my pastel rainbow fix with this custom, so for the next one, let's do a saturated rainbow character. I know, so different, right? We sure do variety on this channel. Here's the sketch. I usually struggle with color, but can I just say, I think I nailed it this time. Using a palette where literally all the colors are available to you can be quite overwhelming. But while the hair is pure rainbow chaos, the skin, sweater, and shorts provide solid blocks of color to look at so that your eyes aren't too overwhelmed. The sweater was inspired by this adorable number I came across on Instagram by user Ali the Loaf. I love the way it's patched together from different fabrics, and of course, the giant heart in the center is very fun. Alright, let's get started. Who's it gonna be? None other than Laguna Blue from Monster High, Generation 3. Ooh, my first Gen 3 custom. As you can see, the doll's already been prepped for customizing. You may even recognize this doll from my previous two videos. She's one of the dolls that needed her neck repaired. Let's start with the head. Gen 3 dolls have bigger ears, which means I can mess with them like this and still have plenty of ear to go around. Don't get me wrong, I love Laguna spins, but I want my character to have human ears. Gen 3 heads are slightly harder vinyl, so carving and sanding is a more viable option than it used to be. Even so, I wasn't able to get the ears completely smooth. Hopefully when we paint the skin later, all minor defects will get covered up. On to the hair. It's one thing to simply draw a rainbow hairstyle, but how do you actually realize it? I had to sit down and map everything out. So okay. not only do I need to consider the colors, but also which sections of hair are going to form the bangs, the braid, the bun, and the rest. This is easily the most complicated reroute hairstyle I've ever attempted. Do you see this? We haven't even started plugging yet and it already looks like madness. I coat the acrylic paint with two layers of matte varnish to ensure it stays in place. I definitely need the guide for this one. Okay, time for doll hair. Let's see how this goes. As not to get completely lost in the hair, I take each color one at a time, starting with them. Take a pinch of ten or so hairs, slip them onto your tool, and stab that head. You know, oftentimes during the reroute, and especially when you're towards the end of a hang, the hairs can get pretty unaligned, you know? I don't think I've ever talked about this before because it's so hard to film, but let's try it this time, yeah? So you take your plug and fold it in half like usual. Then you hold it up high so that the individual hairs catch the light and you can see what you're doing. This is the part that's hard to film, by the way. Then I pull the hair straight and jiggle it around until the short ends pop out, then pull them down to be even with the rest. I honestly do this for every single plug because it makes things nice and tidy. Because, you know, the rooting process isn't time consuming enough already. That's yellow done. Next is green, blue, indigo, 
purple or more like magenta, neon pink, and orange. That'll do it. Squirt some galaxy glue into the head and squish it around to make sure the loose plugs are coated with glue. Leave the head to dry overnight. And when you come back the next day, you can fully appreciate your work. Ah, yes, look at that delectable waterfall of colors. It's so perfect. God, I love rainbows. Sorry, I'm supposed to keep these videos PG. Let's set the head aside for now and turn to the body. Apart from fixing the neck peg, there are some other minor adjustments to make to the dog. Little things like filling in holes in the legs, and shaving down various fins and scales that the original character had. Now that the base is good and truly ready, we can paint our hot pink. Because I've learned nothing from previous projects, I'm even willing to use my fluorescent paint. Prepare yourselves for my camera not being able to handle me on. I did a lot of color correction in post, and this is still the best I could get it to look. The reason I chose G3 Laguna was thanks to her pink skin tone being the closest match to neon pink. Even with good technique and quality materials, you can expect paint to rub off around the joints. So if the plastic color is at least in the same color family or a similar value, it won't look too bad. It's going very well except for her lower legs, which refuse to become opaque. It's that fancy blue plastic causing the problem, isn't it? I should have done this first, but better late than never. I coat the lower legs with a solid white layer of gesso primer, then the pink paint finally shows up. Heck yeah! Look at this hot pink skin tone! My eyes are burning! This rules! <laughs> I tried to add some subtle blushing to the knees and wrists, but the pink is so bright you really can't see it. Once you're happy with the paint job, seal it in with matte varnish. I give the doll two to three coats. Of course, don't forget the head, we need to paint it too. But before that, uh, this is why I uploaded a teaser to Instagram and was checking the comments, and people were speculating what doll it was and noticed that the ears had been cut, and this one commenter was like, oh, they seem like rough cuts before she makes it look better. <laughs> and I was like, oh snap, I was going to call this good enough, but they're expecting better from me. <laughs> so I got out a new fine grit of sandpaper and really sanded them down nice and smooth, like for real this time. They're very smooth. Thanks for keeping me on my toes, community. Now pop the head back on and paint the head as well, including varnish at the end. Once that's dry, mask off the hair and grab your filtration mask. It's Mr. Super Clear sealant time. A couple sprays off the window should do the trick. This primes the surface to accept the materials we're about to use. Let's give her a new face. Wow, the camera does not like being this close. <laughs> Apologies for the amateur video quality. Begin with the line work. I start with the lash lines and creases of the eyelids. Apart from her iris color, I'm keeping this character's face up simple and muted. So, brown lashes, brown and dark magenta for the shading, dark magenta lips, etc. No fancy makeup this time. The rest of the doll is so bright and complicated, I thought a simple face would ground the character. Throw down a watery acrylic base for the eye whites. And a white base would be useful for her irises too, actually, so let's add that also. These thin layers don't take long to dry, so pretty quickly I can layer up the pigments until I'm satisfied with the color and opacity. And remember, if you're trying to face up for yourself, there's no right or wrong way to go about it. I'll switch back and forth from pencils, paint, pastels, sequence doesn't seem to matter. Come to think of it, that's something I've always really loved about doll customizing, the materials. Each doll is a very multi unit project. Whereas painting involves a canvas and oils, let's say, a doll involves plastic, Sealants, textiles, sometimes clay, epoxy, woodworking, resin, even electronics. <laughs> this hobby is wild. No wonder it's endlessly fun. If you're a creative person who enjoys working with physical mediums, you'll love doll customizing. Went off on a tangent there, my bad. Add a couple eye shines and the face is done. 
Give the face a final spray of sealant and let that dry. Surprisingly, you can see the details of her face up quite clearly. I don't know, I guess I thought the neon was so powerful that you wouldn't be able to see anything else, which is true to some extent. <laughs> Let's Liquitex the lips for a shiny effect. You can do this to the eyes too if you want, but it makes photographing the doll harder in my opinion. Let's see how the face looks with the hair. <laughs> what is it about seeing a full spectrum of colors that brings me such joy? Is there science behind this? Color theory, I guess. I know I'm not the only one. Time to style this chaos. I'm already working with so many colors, why don't I also attempt the most complicated hairstyle? Okay, so I wish I could take credit for this, but in fact, I'm stealing this hairstyle directly from an Ever After High doll, Ashlyn Ella. If you've watched my videos before, you'll know that the bun struggle is real, and that it's difficult to tie slippery nylon doll hair into cutely shaped buns. Well, some genius hair designer at Mattel figured it out, and I'm going to copy their technique. First things first, I need to find all the parts and redivide the hair into sections, a la my blueprint. Douse the hair with boiling hot water to flatten and shake the fibers downward. Now it lays more like real hair. Hmm, I was gonna do bangs, but now I'm thinking a middle part suits the doll's face shape more. What do you think? Okay, Catherine, no more dawdling. Make the bun already. Comb up the middle section and tie it in the center like a normal ponytail. Now take a pencil and fold the ponytail forward towards the face over the pencil. Take another elastic and tie it off again. As you can imagine, this will be a lot easier with the shorter pencil. <laughs> Then, one more time, wrap the hair back the opposite way over the pencil and use your third and final elastic to tie it off. Finagle and shake the bun while the pencil is still in place. Once you're happy with how it looks, you can remove the tool and voila! A beautifully shaped, doll-sized bun. The rainbow colors provided an extra challenge for this hairstyle. I wasn't able to completely control the colors, so they get kind of mixed and muddled, but I still really like how it came out. Next is the side braid. I was going to do three colors, but it turns out that was too much hair, so I dropped the color to thin it down. The braid lays across the top and wraps all the way around the back, where it's been tied off out of sight. Now to address the dilemma we had earlier, bangs or no bangs? Mm, bangs. You can see the rainbow colors better with bangs. A part of me wishes I had stopped here. This looks really cute. But I want you to clearly see her earrings later, so I chopped off the rest. With the doll body complete, it's time to focus on clothes. The sweater may look complicated, but it was actually pretty easy. Like any other top, I started with a simple pattern consisting of front, back, and sleeve pieces. This is a modified version of my long sleeve shirt pattern. Now, to get the patched together upcycled look, we simply take snippets of other fabrics and sew them on top. I also made a big hard decal to be sewn on the front, similar to Ali's designs as mentioned at the start of the video. That's all the pieces ready. Now we can sew the thing together. I gather the sleeve and sew on the cuffs, which I forgot to photograph, so here's a graphic. Then I sew the shoulder seams, add the neck binding, and attach the sleeves to the bodice. I zip up the side seams, which includes closing the sleeves. And, just like the cuffs, I gather the bottom of the sweater and add a long strip of fabric. With a little velcro, the garment is technically finished, but we can detail this sucker even further with some well-placed acrylic paint. I brighten up parts of the fabric, added a decal, and of course painted lines around the edges of the sweater. Take a large rectangle, fold it in half and gather it, then stitch in the ditch to attach it to the sweater. And it's done! Is this not the cutest dang sweater you've ever seen? <laughs> the back's a little boring, but that'll be concealed by hair, so it's alright. I gotta see it on the doll. Yes, just like my concept art, the pink and yellow are really complementary to each other. This could not be going any better. Let's do the shorts. So, as mentioned in my Gen 3 dolls video, the new boobies have different body types, meaning none of my patterns fit these dolls. Well, the looser clothing still works, but skin-tight clothes like leggings and pants? Not a chance. The closest fit was my Monster High Boy slash PT 
ESL pants pattern, so I use that as a launching point. There was a lot of modifying and tweaking little bits here and there, but that's not very fun or entertaining, so here's the finished print. To get the distressed look, I simply left the legs unhemmed and scraped a needle through the fabric a couple times. She's got streamers coming off her shorts, so I cut 18 centimeter length strips of ribbon and heat sealed the edges. I would have done a full rainbow, but I didn't have all the colors, so I settled on orange, yellow, blue, and purple. Four in the front and four in the back. I simply stitch these to the waistband and the shorts are done. They look amazing layered under the sweater and the streamers give it a fun kinetic quality. I had grand plans to craft the ultimate pair of sneakers from plain fabric and went so far as to draw up a pattern. But then, like, look at these factory made shoes from Claude Dingo. I don't know if I can do better than that, guys. I decided to simply add some paint and use these instead. Hey, I did really good with the sweater and shorts, so give me a break. <laughs> Shoes are really hard. While we're on the subject of upgrading existing doll accessories, how about this skateboard from the new Gullion doll? So cute! The bottom has some superhero design. It's probably explained in the new Monster High cartoon, but I haven't watched it to be honest. Let's customize it to fit our new character a bit better. After priming the board with black gesso, it's time to decorate. Here I have a bag of random stickers that I received from a friend. Most of them have a vintage theme, which is perfect for that grungy skateboarder aesthetic. There's also a small selection of rainbow letters. Surely we can use these. Hmm. Those of you who are good at Scrabble have probably already spotted some excellent words. I knew I'd miss something obvious if I didn't ask the internet for help, so I turned to Twitter. Boy, you guys really delivered too. Thanks to everyone who replied. I never would have come up with half of these. Hot geese! It was hard to choose, but I'm gonna have to go with Sugoi, suggested by Sky the Golden. It's the Japanese word for cool, and it feels like it's basically been adopted into the English lexicon at this point. <laughs> it's just the right amount of new shit here. Alright, let's just go for it. I keep a razor and scissors handy to trim the stickers down so that they fit perfectly into place. I think this is a Hallmark sticker you used to seal an envelope. <laughs> Gotta use the pony sticker. Hmm, changed my mind about that Pez sticker. Whoops. Okay, time to stick on our word of choice. Yeah, this looks great. I think we've got room for one more word. What do we have left? Hmm. Okay. Collage is fun, isn't it? It feels like our Rainbow Girl character customized the skateboard herself, you know? It's got that homemade look to it. To ensure the stickers don't go anywhere, apply a thick layer of glue over the entire surface. I use Opum Bond, and it's great for this stuff. I know because I've done the exact same thing on one of my sketchbook covers a couple of years ago, and it's still holding up great. Pop the wheels back in, and the skateboard is done. All that's left are the tiny accessories and finishing touches. I drew a band-aid with colored pencil, cut it out, and glued it to the doll's knee. She probably got a spray from practicing a backside for the 60. I glued together several sheets of yellow construction paper to layer up thickness, then cut out two stars and a teeny tiny moon to beat her earrings. Take embroidery threads that have been saturated with glue and wrap them around the doll's fingers to make tiny rings. Super cute. String together a length of rainbow seed beads to make the perfect necklace. And make her a matching bracelet too, why not? And with that, our rainbow girl is fully decked out and ready to be the most colorful skateboarding high schooler you've ever seen.
different time than usual naming this character. I wanted something bright and colorful, of course. Spectrum, Spectro, Aurora, or to use the... What gemstones are iridescent? Let's see. Lab Google right. Yeah, that's not gonna work. Well, I was trying to avoid it because there's already a bunch of famous and beloved characters with this name, but she looks like a ruby to me. Ruby is just the perfect match for her. I love it. The name is not optimized for Google search results, but that's a hit I'm willing to take. Something about her gives me cool senpai vibes. Maybe she's a couple grades ahead of Toki, but they still hang out at the skate park. Just like how roller skating and high heels seems like a bad idea, I can't imagine skateboarding with a bunch of streamers attached to your shorts would lead to anything good. It does make for some dynamic action shots, though. did a good job at the time, but looking at the photos now, I really butchered the bangs, huh? I blame the fact that I couldn't find my hair scissors. Yeah, let's blame the tools. In some of the images, you may have spotted her wearing a backpack. That's the original Lacuna Dolls backpack, unaltered in any way. It just fit her perfectly, so I added it for the photo shoot. I'm still, 
I'm still getting used to the movement. Okay, maybe it's not as bad as I think it is. For some reason, it was... It was just like... Explode. <laughs> well, alright then. So, this is a free roam... Free roam Five Nights at Freddy's game where you're locked in a sewer. I don't know why I'm in a sewer. I don't know why there's animatronics in the sewer. But there are. And that's something that we have to deal with. We don't get dealt in the car. Oh my god! Detected! Oh, what do we- oh, shh. What is that? What am I looking at there? What is that? Oh, is that an animatronic? Oh my god. What? This is awful. Alright, I... I guess you're cool then. Are you cool? I don't like this! Okay. So... Okay. Wonderful. WHY?! IS THAT POSSIBLE?! Oh, I- OH MY GOD! Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Okay, so I think I- I- I, <laughs> I think I just backed myself into a corner with that one. Um... And maybe I was overreacting. The, the head bob doesn't seem as egregious as it was before. It is still a little wobbly. I think it's the fact that it moves, like, in every direction. Okay. So he's come down there. So eventually, I suppose... Okay, if I draw him over here. So come take a look at him. All right. <laughs> oh, fool! Oh, my God! Oh, frick! Oh, frick! Oh my god! Oh, I'm dying! Oh my god, there was a whole other way to go here! Hey! Oh my god! You know, you can leave me alone at any moment now. You can leave me alone, you guys. I, I, well, there's no escape for me or anybody. Oh, what? Um, well, like most things in my life, that went poorly. I'm just gonna keep going this other way that I didn't know existed. And then I'm gonna find a wrench. Why? I don't know. Is it my job to be down here? Because I feel like if it was, I would have a wrench. I feel like that's crucial to me completing my task. So therefore, shouldn't I have a wrench? The light from the animatronic or what? Huh. Oh! Oh! 